This week's podcast is sponsored by the Big Onion and Bootle Stand Shopping Centre, an initiative run by Merseyside Expanding Horizons. The Big Onion supports local businesses to return to the high street, as well as working with people wanting to start a business. In addition, the Big Onion runs projects to help people improve their skills and get back to work. To find out more, why not pop in? You'll love it. The Big Onion, a whole new high street experience. Hello everybody and welcome to the Billy Moore podcast and today's special guest is Mark Scanlon. Mark, thanks for coming on, how are you my yeah, mate? Great, thanks for having me Billy. Please put that mic a little bit to you Mark, because yeah. you get, you know, some people know that. That okay? I should be fine now. So Mark, right, I always do this, I don't really know much about you, right, I've seen your face pop up on a few podcasts, um, I don't really watch podcasts, I'm not like a big fan of watching them. Yeah. I haven't got the, the attention span is quite fucking shit really so I want you to tell me a little bit about yourself there's no questions here and then we'll roll with it just there what was it like for you growing up where you're from um moved out a lot lived pretty much I've actually got a little route which I drive now and again to get a few little memories from which is born on Shield Road moved to Tubrook from Tubrook to Daysbrook 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 Days uh, to Daysbrook Barracks so Mason had to some army barracks in Daisy. Uh, then over to buy my Blaine Canny farm. I think we moved about seven times. In how, total, was that, how was that growing up? Like, was it a little bit like uncomfortable? Yeah, I'm still a little bit like, I think there's a bit little part of me now that still always feels unsettled in, in a yeah. way. I don't like being in the same place for, for too long, do you know what I mean? Do you think if you were like, at that age, do you think if you'd have stayed static somewhere for quite some time, that would have been your roots? Yeah, possibly. I don't really feel like people say, where are you from? I, I own ground a lot on Canny Farm. So just to keep it simple, I can't go over the bus born there, then I moved there, then I moved there. So if anyone says, where do you come from? Normally I just say Canny Farm and I live in West Derby. Yeah, it's a mad one, isn't it, where you come from? Because like me and was the same. We moved from, we moved all over the gaff, you know. It was, I, don't know I can't even count how many times we, we did move. And, mm. You know, and find it out where, when, when you're away and people say, where are you from? It's like... You're not too sure, are you? Yeah, you're not too sure. You don't know there's avenues and locations. So yeah, so what is it that you you you, you started to with your life? Um, I started fighting when I was about twenty. That's a bit late, that isn't it, really? Yeah, but at the time MMA was pretty new. So I don't know if you know Paul Cahoon. Boom boom. Boom boom Cahoon, yeah, absolute yeah. pot. Yeah. <laughs> but one of my good mates, um, I owe a lot of Paul. So, um, the wing pilot. Yeah, he's fucking on the bend, isn't he? Yeah. Proper hard case, though. Old school hard case. I think he, um, I think he had something to do with the, with the kid I in, interviewed, May Epi, Mark Epstein. The yeah, they fought, Paul and Mark. They did, didn't he? That's yeah. right. Because he had a little look at, after the after the day interviewed Mark. He had a look at his fights because he needs to get pictures out. when I see him, Paul Cahoon. Yeah, Mark's a proper old school hard case yeah. as well, isn't he? Do you know Mark? Don't what I've seen him in shows. I've cornered people and have been at events to watch the lads, and he's been there. Yeah, he's a boss. Um, so I'm obviously aware of him. Yeah. But seems like a decent guy as well. So you met Paul, got involved in So MMA. I met Paul pretty much cut a long story short, in that age, between like seventeen and twenty one, we used to start going out a little bit and to be honest, thinking I was the absolute boy. End up getting into a bit of conflict with someone in town, having a fight and if I'm honest, realising that I weren't all I thought I was. Yeah. And that's all I'll say that's all I'll say about that. But I didn't get beat to be honest, no. But I still Going with the first time, if, if I've never really spoke about this, but basically, I, I drove into a confrontation in town between two groups of people to either intervene and kind of diffuse the situation, so to say, and fucking end up fighting with someone who was trying to stop getting at Aiden, um, which led to a, a proper organized fight a week later. I hadn't had an organized fight since I was a kid, I was always fighting when I was younger, yeah. <laughs> so, like a week later, I end up on a park with some lad and like proper organized, as you'd imagine, and fucking like shooters or some yeah. daft film like that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But, like a proper organized fight. So, it turns up to have this fight at the time. I'm going through that ball, the head, doing loads of weights, fucking drinking four pints of protein, <laughs> one body part a day, three one minute rounds on the pads. Thought I was, I was hard as fucking Johnny Concrete, you know what I mean. And I'd always been able to have a scrap when I was a kid, I was known for being able to fight. So yeah. obviously still taught at that age, doing me one body part a day. 
I was a big hard case and I had a fight and it must have lasted three, four minutes at the most. Fucking blowing out of my ass, he was blowing out of his ass. Mad, isn't it? And I won't say you won or lost, yeah. you know, but I didn't give a good account of myself and I was embarrassed and that, that's the truth. And so you started getting involved? Literally stopped lifting weights, fucking was on Mo Vama with, with another old mate of mine, Gareth O'Neill a week later. Just started fucking walking up mountains at first because I couldn't run up them. I yeah. went to Mo Vama, they were, he was about 18, 19 stone, Gareth, he's a big lad. And he was flying up, yeah? Flying up me, yeah. The lads who was flying up and I was fucking keeled over on my lower back, seized up, sitting on a bench like that, fucking hell, what have I been doing? Do you know what I mean? So it was like I had a fucking rude awakening, but probably one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me, looking back on it. Yeah, because that reminded yeah. me, like, years ago, like, you know, I was like a rebel without a cause. I remember the shame, seeing a situation, and I thought, mm-hmm. you know, I'd, be, I'd do the right thing and intervene, which caused oh, fucking drama, you know. But you'd probably do the same. I'd do the same thing yeah. again today. And, I, and I've done yeah. it, like I said to you before, the, the podcast, I, I ended up intervening where someone's pulled a blaze on me and I've been stopped because of it. I, I don't know what it is. I think it's because growing up, I've seen it happen around the household with my mum, and you know it wasn't really nice. Yeah. And so, you know, not being able to protect her as a kid. And he always says, you know, when I'm fucking big and strong, I'll be standing off here. And, you but know. we're all going into it. Most of the behaviours and things what we've basically got now, we downloaded from our parents, so they were created through situations, even traumas, things like that, which you've had an emotional involvement in when you've been younger. It's like yeah, a lot that, of the, a lot of the work I do now. It's basically. I'm trying to help people who, um, and at the same time, understand myself, why I behave certain ways, why I react and respond in different yeah. ways. And, but most of it does revert back to your upbringing and yeah. your childhood and, and your and, environment. And the contributing factors that led to, you know, the person that you became. Because for me, it was like, it was, it was I, I never had relationships. There were always reactionships. I'd always react. Yeah. That react, that, it was like, there was always an agenda to everyone's compliment. You know, when anyone said something nice to me, it was like, what does he want? Or what does she want? Why yeah. do they think? Because I had that way of being conditioned where I felt it was... You no know, one does nothing for you for no, nothing. There's, 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 yeah, you know, didn't trust anyone. You know, and um, I think for myself, I was at school and that the reason I got into fighting was because when I was at school, no one would pass me the fucking ball. I'd never get picked for the football team. I, I, I didn't feel like I'd be, be a team player or anything. So, like... A solitary sport like boxing, where you have to depend on yourself, basically, was was something that I was kind of up for. Yeah, I was fine a lot when I was a kid, but again, I'm, it's still something. I, even to this day, I've fucking been working on myself solidly for yeah. ten years. It's probably end up speaking about that further through, obviously the podcast. But I'm still trying to figure things out to this day. I used to be obsessed with fighting when I was a kid, but I think really it was through fear. The reason I wanted to fight with everyone. Yeah. Or I wouldn't back down from a fight is because I was scared of maybe people starting to think I was a victim and trying to pick on me. And at the same time, it was something what I was naturally good at. I was naturally yeah. tough and a big head on me. And even before I'd ever lifted weights, so or yeah. I was a strong kid. I found myself in fights a lot of the time at lads older than me because they'd say things to me or they'd try and pick on me or they'd say something to me, brother. And I was the man of the house. The well, I was the man. I've always been the man of the house. So. Yeah. How old are you now, man? Uh, 37. So, you know, you're still only young as well, aren't you? So. Yeah, you could say that. Yeah, I remember back in the day, don't you look at people who were like 30 and think, he's finished Sorry, him, do you know what I mean? <laughs> but yeah, I think 40's definitely the new 30, isn't it? And yeah, it's got to be. I mean, 30, like, maybe I'm, the new 20s. I'm you fucking mean? hanging in there. I'm still on my 40s, like, but I'm not but, at the arse end of it. But I'm still trying to figure out, even to this day, I still yeah. question myself a thousand times a day and certain things I look back because obviously I'm aware of how... Um, how much of an influence your childhood has over your behaviours now and who you are. Um, I still look back on a lot of things and try and understand maybe why I'm a certain way and reflect on myself and my behaviours, my personality. And so do you never say you're in, your own inventory? You know, like say, for example, like you know, it, you know when you know when you know when you're wrong, you you admit it and then make amends. You know, one million percent, yeah. Yeah, because that's for me was like a big one, a big change. That was yeah. probably one of the, you know. I was on the right path then when people say you know you need to kind of admit you're wrong and, uh. the only way you can move forward is by accepting where you make mistakes or where you're not doing the right thing yeah. so and and that's it and that's what I'm even to this day as I say I believe I do a lot of the right things now in the past I've done a lot of the wrong things I'm constantly analysing what I'm doing yeah. and trying to become a better person that's my goal yeah. I've had written goals and different types of goals in the past now my goal is just every day to get up and do whatever I need to do to be better than I was yesterday. And you hear that a lot lately and it's this cliche thing, but I think really that should be everyone's fucking deepest 
you know, it's intention, it's in all of us. We, we should all be trying to progress and be yeah, well, the best person we can be in every aspect, not just in in one or two, I believe, in, in everything. I read something the other day, it was a comment, and it was about myself, and someone had watched the podcast, and uh, they put a nice comment underneath it, and they said, hey, there's, uh, there was no, there's no sinners without, there's no saints without a past, and there's no sinners without a future. And I thought, you know what, that's, that's there's no, you know, I was never, you know, the claiming to be Mother Teresa when I was growing up, and, and I was involved in a lot of uh, stuff that was due to, kind of to fear the drug habit you know I, I was doing things that I didn't want to do but yeah you do change you know and you do reflect and and you make amends and you make a difference to not only yourself but your family and the community and that ripple effect does go further yeah, far and beyond yeah. yeah and then you've got certain individuals where I don't like to mention no names and I won't start like to put you down uh, bring it up and then I think to myself, I'm glad that I've, had, I've got a bit of awareness and understanding because that's the same person I was. I was quite envious, quite jealous. Um, I, did, I hated everyone. So I'd bring up their shit because, you know, it made me feel better about my shit, you know, yeah. that I was still currently doing. You know, I'd put you down to elevate myself. But a lot of stuff like that's just a mirror of who you are. You see things in people. Yeah. Like a lot of the people who I've studied over the years, they basically, well, the thing what you don't like about someone is a reflection of... Yeah. Yeah. something what's in you do you know what I mean but at the same time it's good to get to the point where you start to look at yourself in certain parts of your life which I do all the time even now and I've done over the years where I look back and know exactly who I was at a certain point in my life and I see what was going on around me and a lot of the time you think like the stuff what's going on around you, you that's why you feel a certain way or act a certain way but it's actually for me it's the other way around it may be around the wrong kind of people and you're doing the wrong things and yeah. then obviously the, the effects of that will always be negative on you when you start to do the right things and start to behave the right way and think the right way, yeah. then you just find naturally the right things start to happen. You start to filter out more good things and meet more good people. And like they're called synchronicities. Do you know what I mean? When you're on the right path, these synchronicities seem to happen. And yeah, it's, it's for me. But when it started working for me was when my mum and it was like it was going back. I'm going back over a few years now. When I couldn't even name, I was down. I was in a, down a block in Leeds. I had a bit of a bad time. You know, I felt like. No one gave a shit about me and no one cared. And I had these odds to phone my mum and I phone. I used up the, the, what he had to phone my mum and she said, Bill, I couldn't even speak to her because it was like, it was, I was welling up and she knew. She went, just ask for help. That was the first time something had sank in. I thought, fucking hell, maybe that's what I need to do. Reach out and ask for help. And I did and I sat down and I wrote this letter and, and, and I reached out and asked for help and, and things started to happen. I think that's what's... Um, that pride and that ego, we can do it on our own, you know, but no man's an island, so... Sometimes it's all you know, though, do you know what I mean? The holes I knew was how to do things and deal with things and if I needed something, I had to get it myself. No yeah. one was there to give it to me. Yeah. And now it's a gift. And now I'm aware that I've got this gift and I honestly believe I can have anything, like absolutely anything. But yeah. at the same time, I know it comes at a cost, which is always your time, your energy and your attention. But when you've got two kids who... You think the world of and a wife who you love and it's like you've got to be consciously aware of where you're putting your time where you put your energy yeah. it's balanced yeah. yeah i'm at a point in my life where i've spent a lot of time trying to build businesses and earn money and i'm, I'm doing all right in that area of life so now it's like well them goals see, which yeah. i've kind of achieved in a set to a certain extent I, I can now start to focus on the other things the things which to be honest mean more than money to me which is being present with my kids so yeah. Like we spoke before, I have weekends, it's family time. No one rings me on the weekend anymore because I don't speak to them because it's all about the family. I'm in a position to be able to do that. Some people have to work the weekends. I've been there and done it. Yeah. But now I'm at a point where weekends are for the family. I have certain days where I do certain things. Monday I work as much as I can. Wednesday's the time I work as much as I can. Tuesdays, if the opportunity's there, I'll spend some time on myself. I'll study, do the things I enjoy. Thursdays, I'm in schools all day coaching, which is gives me loads of fulfillment and happiness, yeah. I love it, do you know what I mean? Fridays, I do a work in the morning, whatever I need to do in the afternoons, time with me missus. And that's like, took me years to get that little formula. There's been it points where, so, yeah, it's, it's balance, it's perfect course, balance yeah. for me, do you, do you know yeah. what I mean? Doesn't but, happen, doesn't happen overnight. And if you've got no money, there's no such thing as balance because your, all your energy and time's got to go into getting financially stable because you've got bills to pay. So it's not, you, you have to work towards balance. You can't have balance all the time because at the end of the day, if you've got kids to feed 
and you've just lost your job, balance goes out the window because it's time to fucking go and get some money. Do you know what I mean? But it's, you know, it's, it's never ending. It's never perfect. It's like, I'm constantly working on it. These are things where I enjoy what I've studied. I've studied people, I've read loads of books and to get me where I am now. And like, so, yeah, it's obviously that you've got loads of self-awareness and I think for myself, mm-hmm. it's, I've learned over the years, you know, because I was like emotionally stunted. I was, I was a big lad, but I was like, I was acting like a teenager still. You know, I was in my late twenties, early thirties, still acting like a kid. Mm-hmm. I didn't understand why I behaved like a kid. I did um, react and respond. Um, and then I went through this program where it was all about that self awareness. I read a lot. I, I wrote a fucking hell of a lot. It was quite therapeutic. The catharsis in writing was important because you know I could write about myself and, and not deny the truth. You know, but I could. I could be like Mr. Ben and sell fucking you what you wanted to hear and yeah. become a chameleon and fit in, you know, wherever I wanted to. But yeah, you know, it's like trying to find out who you really are. But I spent a lot, I, get, I got that through fine because I spent pretty much three, four months of the year in Brazil and I was in a country where I didn't really, most of them didn't speak my language and I'd spend a lot of time on my own just questioning myself, asking myself who I am. I've always been curious. I've, I fucking loved science when I was in school. Like the mystery of fucking the universe, and I've always been curious, and I, I I always will be. I love learning. Like I'm a fucking obsessed, borderline with, like studying and learning, and I want to know the ins and outs of fucking the world, spirituality, um, you know, fucking science, neurology, your mind. I'm, I'm if, if I'm honest, fucking your mind is like what really um, I'm the most curious about them. What I love because when I look back over my life, as we were speaking about again before. Yeah, your mind's everything. That's the fucking like. That's the commander. That's the ship. And whatever he says goes. But if he's not working properly, then you fucking ship and can't leave the dock. And that's like an old saying. Well, you know, you, you hear that a lot in different forms. But when you think about it, it's so true. Because I look back on my life and I can basically see where I was in different parts of my life. Take myself back there, and I know how my mind was working at the time. So it's like even like in fighting. Um, I speak about fighting because I had no prior uh, experience apart from fucking scrapping when I was a kid. So I, you, you, were, you were a game kid, basically? I was always fighting, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Again, just like whether it was to intimidate people to keep them away from me because I was scared or things happened when I was yeah. a kid. And, you know, for whatever reason, I, I, I just wanted to be left alone, maybe. As I say, I'm still trying to figure this out, but at the same time, I, I used to be known for it, so it was like me little, you know, a bit of attention and these like... And I, I I know like when you speak about ego, it was definitely like it fed me ego. Yeah. Um. So maybe there was more than one reason behind why I fucking if games of footy. I had more red cards than fucking anyone. Foul one of my mates, and that was it. it was, I was in goal. I'd be like to the manager, bring me out now. He's getting in. He yeah. fucking next minute I'm out. Fucking <laughs> ironing someone out. Fight my parents on the line, and, and often when I look back, it's not something I'm proud of. You know, it's funny, and we can laugh about it now. Yeah. But there's a reason why I was that way. So again, it's just trying to figure out well, what's the reasons why and obviously trying to fix them and make sure that my own kids don't go through maybe the same things. And you're just forever learning, aren't you? And that's yeah, and it's, you know, it's, 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 I like the, <clears throat> the fact that, you know, that you can talk open and honestly about that because it encourages other people to go, you know what? Well, that's something I'm really, really big on. You've got to practice what you're preaching. I'm all about getting outside your comfort zone and, of the integrity in it, what you see. I've done a lot of things, what like I I preach what I practice, it's not, I don't practice what I preach, that's like me. Uh, Did you, let's ask me, there's a question for you, right? Did you suffer, right, with guilt and shame before you kind of became aware of Um, the stuff that you were doing? Probably for years I did. No, if I'm honest, I was just, I was just asleep to it all. Yeah. When you look at, drive through town and walk through town, I walk through town on a Saturday afternoon or, um, I spend a lot of time in Blackpool if we think because I play the place where I've got where I go with the kids yeah. and my wife it's not far from Blackpool but you're just on autopilot um, and you're not aware of what's going on as you said before you've yeah. got a response and a reaction well the response is a thought out action so you slap me now and yeah. I go hang on Billy's just slapped me there well why is Billy slapped me okay maybe he's fucking had murder with his missus and he's just dead angry and he's got something going on himself and no, maybe I shouldn't slap him back. Maybe you should see if he's all right. And yeah. that's that's a response where Billy slaps me. I jump up and me and Billy start fighting. Well, that's that that's an un- that's an unconscious yeah. action. Yeah. And that's how people live. They live unconsciously. They let the external world 
dictate and control how they feel internally and then your life is only an expression basically of how you feel you feel shit your words are shit everything's negative you think anyone who does it for you does it on ulterior motive and you just attract them filter out negative more fucking shit I know I had, I had, I had an experience you know, mm-hmm. that with a friend he was reacting a bit off beam and I thought this is not him you know and it became like borderline aggressive and I thought how do we how do we respond and it's like there's a moment between like you know the, the men and the yeah. boys you go and I had to breathe right and then I know it's a cliche but you play the tape forward and you see what the outcome is and I'm pretty good at going okay this is the outcome now there's things that can get said to me and, and people are looking for responses and then you get goaded why don't you say that back why don't you say this and you think well you know what right I don't say that and I won't say it because I'm mature I've grown up I'm not in the playground no more with the play kids and the play pens and all that gear. I've actually been there and I never shaved the paper shows I never did was ostracised me from everyone. I felt isolated. I was self obsessed because I, I, I thought everyone was like you know the paranoia was kicking in with it all. Yeah. And it was the loneliest place you could you could take. And you know when you're talking about Brazil and no one spoke English and you know you, you spend a lot of time with yourself and that was exactly the same with myself sitting in a shell with eighty ties and not one of them. Tell you, Mark, not one of them spoke English, and if they did, it was pidgin English. And it was only to say, You have lovely blue eye. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, okay, now, how, do you, how, how do you make how do you form a conversation out of that? I had to learn, to, you know, and then when I learned it, I was thinking, You're messing, mate. I don't know what the fuck I'm saying now. They're talking about me. And it was, well, you, you can't, where was it a no win situation with them? Yeah. Some are great and some weird. But yeah, that's that. They, 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 they meditated a lot, and I was like a leggy mouse. I could not shit. You said to me before coming in, say two breaths in and yeah, just and one out. Breaths, because the anxiety, I, I, you know, I don't, you know, that, that's a bit, let's be honest here, I, I get anxious prior to yeah. interviews. I'm in and out of the toilet, fucking half a dozen times. I don't know why that is, and that's probably fear. It's normal, but it, it, it can just be a bit of nerves, and that, yeah. that's normal. Do you know what I mean? Maybe for you, this is outside your comfort zone. It has been for me in the past. Yeah. I'm getting more comfortable speaking, but I know. For me, it's always like I, I used to think I can't. I used to watch people doing videos themselves yeah. on the likes of Instagram and be like, oh, that's what they what's, what's, But you don't he, realize that he's done about 20. But basically, I'm saying, look, that, that's because that's how I'd feel if that yeah. was me making that video. That's not just me and he is. That's me projecting how I'd feel if I was basically sitting there filming myself. Yeah. All, all I'm doing is, is really, without realizing, it's expressing how I'd feel in that situation. Yeah. But at the same time, if you've got. Like, I, I, I'm on social media. I was off Instagram for a few years. It didn't save me. I was just scrolling the same as most people do. Yeah. The average Instagram user c- picks up the phone subconsciously, meaning they don't know they're doing it, and checks Instagram, opens it, scrolls and closes it over 150 times a day. And that was me, walking through a park with my kids, fucking on my phone, scrolling Instagram, while, while fucking my daughter, as a baby, fucking not long learned to walk, and she's there, and I'm like on Instagram. I'm not even there. So I'll become aware of that and I came off it for a while because I needed to. But now I use, I spend, I have a timer on my phone which you can set on Instagram. I use it for one hour a day. I respond or reply to as many people as I possibly can. Some yeah. I can't. So if, I, if you've messaged me and I haven't, I apologise. Send me another one and I'll do my best to get back to it. But I do what I can, but I use it for an hour a day and that's my limit. I try and not to go over it at any point. And I just use it to share bits of videos, posts, things where I feel it's irrelevant. Platform, well, it's a platform that's a platform positive, to yeah. help people, yeah, yeah, it's positive, like everything I put on there, 99.999% positive. And then I get feedback, so people message me to say, I that's needed right, to see yeah. that today, that's relevant to me, because cause the uh, platform kind of what I've got and the person who I portray myself as, which is actually who I am, because all these things I practice, people kind of know now that over the mindfulness I've got a sense of which, obviously, we um, encourage meditation, fitness, mm. yoga. It's, it's a lot of stuff to do with your mind, and there's so many people struggling at the minute. I do tend to, in conversations, go in the gym with me in the supermarket, and people will open up to me and tell me the problems. So if, I'm, if I've got certain things, what I've, like I follow some different like um, pages on it, Instagram, and if I find things which are relevant to which people are maybe um, bumping into in my day-to-day life, are saying I'm struggling with this and I'm having problems with that, I'll try and put the answers through posts in the morning. And I do wear them up at uh, quarter five every morning. So people get up in the morning, first thing they do is go on my story and go, okay, 
and loads of the things synchronized with how they're feeling or problems what they're experiencing or and the amount of people sometimes believe you get 30 messages in the morning by the time i'm taking the kids to school nine o'clock i've had 30 messages thank you for that meant this and yeah, being yeah. struggling with that and it's like that's that's what i use it for do you know what I mean? So it's for me, it's it's a tool and I use it to share. Yeah, and do you know what makes me agree? Because it's not like I don't believe that uh, social media and there's a lot of toxic like like platforms out there that are just promoting like bad energy. See, I believe it's important to promote positive. You know, I, I may say this to me not so long ago. So Bill, we're blessed with a few short years on on this planet. He said it goes it goes pretty quick. You know, let's put a smile on people's face instead of like putting people down. And, and, and all that negative fucking energy it's it's so i am um, like i do a lot with my brother you, you've probably seen it as well yeah, you know, and he's, he's fucking great he's lovely and you know when he, we do a little video with him it, it, it's there and then you can't keep redoing them with him because he he, he, he doesn't remember nothing uh, and that's it uh, that i get loads of messages on, on about him saying what you know it's inspirational he got from a couch couldn't even get off the couch to climb up Snowden, it was incredible. It was in fucking alley. Done better than me. I was goosed by the time mm. I came down. Like, but yeah, that's it's and that's what it, that's that's rewarding. You know, when your people say, you know, thanks, you've made my day that a little bit better. Yeah, but, but no, I've, I've said it up before. I'm, everything's information. Everything we do is information. So what's your the stuff what you're doing, what you're putting out there, the way you're treating your brother, the way you're out him. You know, there'll be people out there who don't really know how to deal with their situation. They may be in a similar situation to you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think there's nothing more powerful than like being an example for other people. If you've been through something or you're going through a certain experience or you're dealing with something or if they if 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 you if you deal with it in a way which obviously helps your brother, helps you, other people see that. For me that's that's one of the greatest things about the likes of Instagrams and all these social media pages, do you know what I mean? Yeah. You can actually share experiences and information with people which which helps them. The problem is a lot of people who use the social media and all that, um, they've got no self awareness and, and they lack discipline. So the the people who a lot of them will say these phones are the devil, the this, the that, the shit, the whatever. But not actually the phones, it's it's how they're using them. It's like you could say food's the same. Yeah, people it's abuse. it could be it could become an obsessive. Yeah addiction you know and i believe you know for me in the past it's like i couldn't i was like i was i was just identifying with you walking through the park and i'm probably still like that at the best of times and i've got to make plans and i keep saying you know and i spoke to a few friends about it as well that i'm going to put time aside yeah. just for social media <coughs> and i'm more it's time a tool. yeah you use it as a tool because if you don't use it as a tool it's using you and it's one or the other you're either using it as a method to keep in touch with certain people to put a message out there to, to build a business to market to, to whatever it's the greatest platform in the world for fucking marketing or marketing yeah. well, you only got to look at COVID now the amount of people who've come off by working 9 to 5 or they've stopped working 9 to 5 and they've created businesses just yeah. through Instagram alone so it's a powerful tool massive uh, it's amazing but at the same time for a lot of people it works against them because it's the biggest one of the biggest distractions in the world you drive down Tubaruk now all the road works or places I, I've, I've seen it because I'm obviously involved in businesses myself. I don't like anyone having phones while they're working because I don't like seeing you know what I what annoys the life out of me. It's like when people are driving and I've got the phones. I see fellas on diggers. Yeah. Fucking just literally sitting there on diggers. No wonder they're all they, 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 they take fucking years to get all these old decks done because you'll drive down and they'll literally be on the phone when they're meant to be working. Somebody's standing around on phones and but the funny thing is they're not even aware most of them that they're doing it. It's just becomes it's normal, just normal it? yeah. yeah it's fucking shit like so it's it's basically every time you with these phones you're practicing distraction like i'm big on like the meditation side of things meditation teaches you to focus do you know what i mean it teaches you to be present yeah. when you're present and you actually have got a good level of self-awareness well you start to be able to take control over these things and then if you can apply that with discipline or combine it with discipline then you can start to manage yourself more and the more you can manage yourself and the more disciplined you are, it actually gives you more freedom. I used to, um, I used to read a lot of uh, Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was going through a few feelings at one point in my life where it was like, I was always thinking about what could have been or should have been and then yeah. I was projecting into the future and I was all I was in all that anxiety and fear about what could be and what. I, and, and then it was like, look, be in the moment. I'm 
kind of I struggle with that meditation. I kind of I think for me meditating is going to the gym. I go to the gym. I'm on my own. I focus. You know, and I know what I'm doing. So I kind of got him into it like here. I could solve the power now. That'd be great for me if I could actually like ground myself and be in that moment. But I'm one who's just like I'm fucking away with the fairies. I'm fucking. I off think and running. people have a misconception over meditation, though. And I always mention Martin Bone. He's really, really fucking. He's my brother, really close friend of mine, and he's amazing meditation. He's fucking like proper black belt meditation. Is he? And. Um, runs all courses and things like that. I'd encourage anyone to do them. Everyone close to me and my family, I've had me missus on it, me mum on it. Like people who are close to me, I've, I've I've spent years fighting shells, right? I mean, fucking decades, starting to meditate, even blagging it. So when you, it was, it's been like, But what's your idea of meditation? Focus. Physically, what's your idea of meditation? Physically, well, I, you know, I think it's just training. For a lot of people, this is meditation, sitting there with the legs yeah, crossed. Yeah, and that's... that's but you can, that's I can be meditating and driving down Kenny. And that's exactly, exactly what I was going to say, because, you know, you're, you're focusing on the road, and you're there in it's that present, moment. It's present, just yeah. being aware of how I'm feeling, where am I? Like, for me, trees, have not, I've always been naturally drawn to trees. I used to fucking love climbing trees, and I was little, and all the way I say, so obviously think, relate yeah. things back to being kids. I used to climb trees, and all my mates would be playing. I remember I used to sit in this one big tree in, uh, in when we lived in Daisy, and I'd just sit there and observe everything, what's going on in the top of this fucking tree on my own f- I kind of f- for ages and I'd just be sitting I was a bit of a loner when I was a kid to be honest and yeah, I'd spend a lot of time just sitting in this tree just watching all the kids playing footy tick whatever they were doing and I weren't getting involved I was just like up in this and I've always had a real strong attraction to to trees and nature the sky I love them like literally and they bring me to presence so I can be driving down Kenny and you know Kenny's fucking chaos isn't it driving down Kenny in traffic and there's a big blue sky or a spotted tree and the next minute I'm in presence, and for me that's like, I feel like I'm in a state of meditation in in part of the day. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm sitting there like that. I do actually sit there every morning and make a conscious effort to sit for 10 minutes with my eyes closed, you know, good posture, as you'd say, meditating. It's practice but though, isn't it, Mark, to be fair? For me, it's just awareness. Meditation yeah. is just self-awareness. Because we were, you know, what I mean? I we, you know we, we had to go to a place where we had to, it was like, there was no choice, we had to meditate, it was called like meditation every single morning, we had to go to a certain, certain room in the building, sit there, it was definitely it was six weeks and we were constantly, it was fucking hard work to be fair at the time, mm-hmm. because the way I was, my head was all over the gaff anyway, so it was all distracted, there was distractions, even if like just, just the thinking, the, the process that I was, me, me think, me thought process was all over the gaff, uh, and we were just doing like uh, that uh, you know the, the the talk and meditation, there was a lot of that. Yeah. Um, but when I was getting involved in it and I was practicing it and I was getting past a minute to two minutes to three minutes and we were staying there for like ten minutes, I actually kind of felt settled and enjoyed mm-hmm. being there and look forward to it. Um, I do work with the kids, yeah. so that the kids I work with are between eleven and fifteen, normally around thirteen years old. Yeah. So the session where I run, um, so obviously you know you're doing stuff yourself with the kids and stuff. There's, I um, created a program called um, the I Am Project. So over six weeks I deliver. They, they think I'm going in to teach martial arts because obviously my background in martial arts. Yeah. So I'm going to go in and present myself as a martial arts teacher and I'll mentor you a bit and you know maybe give you a bit of advice. And but basically I'm here to teach you combat for six weeks. But it's not. I go in. We, we do loads of motivational stuff I have them watching like some Muhammad Ali's people who broke world records just inspirational people um, we we do obviously I teach them martial arts so they learn a little bit of MMA some boxing like most of the kids have never done nothing so obviously they learn to progress and how to fight over six weeks um, we do mental fitness which is basically meditation we'll start on two minutes by week six we'll go up to like five six minutes of meditation we do mobility which this bit of yoga so the kids are basically doing a load of motivational inspirational stuff then they do some uh, boxing uh, some MMA the main thing we focus on is progression so we're just improving each week even if it's yeah. only by a little bit because I like to say to them look at the end of it it doesn't matter if you want to be a fighter a martial artist I'm not here to teach teach that what I'm here to, to show you is that you can improve in anything it doesn't have to be martial arts if it's you want to be a builder you want to be a bricky yeah. you want to be a painter Look where you were on day one. I've only had just six hours or eight hours, whatever it's been over this. But look where you are now. 
and that's what the main focus on. But the, the kids, the main part what I'd say they enjoy after three, four weeks is the mental fitness, which is the meditation, and it's being still. It's not a big complicated, I don't really speak to them through it, I just basically say, look, we trained our physical bodies, we've all got a little sweat on by then. We do a thing called the AMRAP, which is as many rounds as you can on a circuit. We keep a record of it each week, and again, they try and by week six be fucking, obviously, a lot further on than they were on week one. But the mental fitness, we increase the time on that, and by by week six, you've got kids sitting there, you've probably never been still, never stop, and just, again, just chaotic kids the same as we were yeah. actually just sitting there like that breathing and being still I've sat there honest to God really fucking like well enough because there's kids who I know they've been full on gangster day one chatting absolute fucking bollocks do you know what I mean like trying to basically trying to impress me and then by week six they're like the same kids yeah like, there's kids who are actually coming to mind now who are actually helping me coach some of the other kids and like fucking leading some of the other kids and buying right into the meditation at the point where they're doing it in between our sessions, Brilliant. do you know what I mean? So it's like, it's amazing. And one of the, that's going back to the meditation, it's, it's something where we naturally want to be still, but we're just in this fucking like program and society and everything else where it's like, it's non-stop. The fast you, life. The fast life, distraction, yeah. basically a life of distraction and all we want a stillness and, I had a, and presence. My, my mates always said to me, Bill, you either stay busy or, you know, you get busy living or you get busy dying. And mm-hmm. for me, that was, that, that kind of, sh- like landed pretty deep really because of the time you know once you know i'm left on my own right i'm in bad company with my own thoughts you know i had loads of uninvited uh, thoughts coming through the back door of my mind they were very intrusive uh, it was affecting my self-esteem it was putting me down it was uh, and, and i did it in my own voice i don't know if you've yeah. ever experienced that way and I'm, I'm, i can identify with a few other people who, who had that shame We've had that same experience. And I think that was due for me, was the addiction. You kind of messed around with my mind over the years. And then you take away the substance and you're left with you, right? So there's no distraction, there's not suppression, those feelings. So there's a lot of people who have been in addiction who've come out of it and had to go through this process of, uh, you said, meditating, being still, self-awareness, learning about how the... Uh, who they are. Who they are and how they react, because for me, you know, you, you take it away, and I, 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 I you know, I'm taking, I put my hands up. I've done really, really well over the years. Fucking help me! Prison blocks, prison roofs, fucking prisons abroad, fighting, fucking all my life, like my fucking ears bits off, stabbed, shot at, fucking help me! I didn't just <coughs> wake up and want a career and getting battered by fucking after kids on out of state. You know what I mean? That wasn't my dream. I wanted to to join the army and I wanted to to beat my mum. And my dad, you know, proud of their son. And I didn't, so I went down this other fucking route where it was it was volatile, it was violent, and for years I had that. So you come out of that, you come out of that, Mark, right? It's like similar to yourself fighting all the time. I come out of that and I was like, whoa, I'm quite comfortable with the anger because when I become vulnerable, it's frightening because I feel as if I'm going to get judged by someone. They're going to see it as a weakness. I can't do that. So I revert back to type, put up those brick walls, and it's so it's like they said to me, it's like a, an onion peeling the, the layers off, you know. And I got to a point where I was fucking shopping, Mark. You know, you had mentioned someone, and I'd, I'd watch an advert and I'd be in bed, going, what the fuck's going on here? Because then I became in such, it was like, yeah. like really raw with my feelings. It, yeah. So we had to go through all that process of like, uh, it's relearning. I, yeah. It's relearning who you, who you, it's weird. Who it's, it. so that's just, and I know there's a lot of people that watch, my podcast that I identify with that stuff and, 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 and you relate. Now, you know, when you're in touch with feelings, like you know, the only feelings I ever knew was like I was, I was, I was either happy or I was sad, right? I didn't understand uh, anything else beyond that. The drug dealer hasn't turned up fucking fuming angry. There's that. He turned up fucking over the moon. That was it. They were the only two that I identified. When um, I was in a group session and we'd done this, like, feelings, yeah. How do you feel? And people going, I feel this. And come to me and I said, I'm feeling okay. And they go, we don't do okay. And I feel all right. All right, it's not a feeling. I'm fine. And then they did me with that fucked up insecure. And I was like, and I was like what the fuck do these want to hear from me? You know, and then some 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 Scots kid said, you're angry, aren't you? Because I was reacting to everything that was getting said to me. And that was like the first time that I could identify that and pinpoint that one. I go, okay, so I'm angry. Why am I angry? 
you know, what's creating that? Bang. It was me insecurities. It was the felt that people were talking to me and I felt less than because what they knew, I didn't, and they were elevating me. And I had that superior, inferior uh, way of thinking. You know, people would talk to me and, 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 and the, the vocabulary was better than mine. I felt that, like, I was always... Inferior to them, yeah. Yeah, and that, that was, like, a problem. See, like, when people, like, this is important, like, and this is what you do going into schools. You know, you've got to be on their level. See, this is where I, what I say, I've got to be on your ground force and with you, mate. Yeah. I'm not going to hit you with all this, like, this language which is going to make me shine's importance and you feel like you don't know what's going on. The key word's relatable. You've got to be relatable to the kids. Yeah. So you can go and send a solicitor in there in the suit and so you can say whatever he wants, but them know, kids yeah. don't want to be solicitors. No. They don't want to wear a suit. Do you know what I mean? I go in in a night tracky and speak to them the way I'd speak to my mates. Yeah. And the way I wanted to be spoken to when I was a 15, 16 year old lad or a 13 year old lad, I know exactly how to speak to them. I coach kids outside of uh, the schools. But I know that their, their picture of success, any any young Scally's picture of success, is a man walking through Castle Street carrying a briefcase. If it's not, it's a lad fucking driving around in an S3, selling whatever. Do you know what I mean? But then, where do, where do we fit in or where do I... I can go in and say, well, I've got a nice car and I've got all the nice things, but I still wear night trackies, but I don't sell drugs and I don't rob no one. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And this is how I've done it. Fucking at four for ten years... I came away from fighting with no education and not a fucking penny, actually own money out in debt. But now I've got everything I've ever wanted. So what was your fighting career like? Because we haven't, we, we touched on it. Yeah. Um, but b- boom, boom. So we spent like, pretty much met boom, boom. Hope you well, my mate. Yeah, if he sees this, <laughs> sending loads of love to boom, boom. But I met Paul anyway. Paul kind of took me under his wing, put time into me, put energy into me and started to coach me a little bit over a couple of weeks. Then I went to the... Um, he had a trip plan to Brazil, so I spent a week in Brazil with Paul. Just jumped on a plane, literally flew over there. Fucking didn't have a clue what I was doing. I was brand new to grappling, just getting twisted up by everyone in the gym. Went over to Brazil, got fucked for a week. Came home, met a few people while I was there over the week, and then just fucking loved it. And was on a plane out there on my own a week later, and spent two two and a half months there the first time. Got absolutely fucking bladdered for the 10 weeks while I was there, but met lifelong friends who I love now and, and I'm still in contact with. I can, like I was laughing, I was speaking to someone this morning, we were speaking about the past and I was saying this to Alan from, from fucking Canny Farm, so to say, but there's a picture of me in, in, a, in a gym kicking someone in the head in Botafogo in Brazil and it's like I never um, reached my potential in fighting, I failed in fighting, I'm dead open to say I, I actually failed in the sport of fighting or mixed martial arts because anyone who knows me will tell you I nowhere near reached my potential. I had all the ability, but I didn't have that. And that's what let me down. Ultimately, it, and I see it in so many other fighters now and I can relate to it because I had no prior fighting experience, but I was six, seven fights in going into the UFC, but I was still trying to figure out nerves, my expectations of... Um, myself of what I thought other people thought of me you know I was trying to deal with all this stuff and and it's it made me actually when like I enjoyed the training and I loved the training I was obsessed with fighting I still am now yeah but I didn't enjoy being in the fight because of the pressure what I put myself under and it was basically based on what my opinion of other people was going to be over me I thought I had to have a perfect fight there's no such thing as a perfect fight I had to go in because I was this. Everyone knew basically how much ability I had. Yeah. I was training, fucking, and coaching UFC fight other UFC fighters. I was training with the best fighters in the world in America, and I was on that level. But then, when it comes to getting a fight, an opponent, or someone like that in the UK, going through, no one really wants to fight because they know you're coaching UFC lads. They know you're fucking in Brazil after you. They might have a twelve or thirteen, I know, record, or they might have a twelve month record. But they want to get to the UFC and want to earn a living out of fighting. So. Why go and fight fucking Mark, who's 5-0, and oh, who's coaching fucking UFC fighters or training with UFC fighters? It doesn't make no sense, and I couldn't blame them for it, but it affected me in the sense that most of the people who I fought, yeah. I was meant to beat them. They were just fucking cannon fodder, they, as they get called, to just basically come and give me a fight. Or if I did get anyone a decent record, I guarantee a week or a couple of weeks out, they'd pull out and I'd be fighting fucking Barry from Wales or whatever. So I was going into them fights, obviously expecting to 
not expecting thinking everyone's expecting me now I've got to like he can't even lay a punch on me it's got to be like a scene out of the Matrix that's what I was expecting of myself <laughs> and I, I hated it I'd rather have been fighting someone fucking you sound like you put massive expectations yeah, on yourself and, and it, but it didn't understand my mind I didn't know what to deal with I was just a fighter obsessed with fighting learning about fighting studying fighting training like a fucking train like an absolute bastard every single day over training under eating just like literally I lived and breathed fighting and I give it my heart and soul but that's what let me down when I come away from it I started to study my mind I'm just not coincidence because there's no did such you, thing but did, did you ever ever you know I mean you must have had a good few mates back then maybe still now that seeing you change and, and start questioning you because I had a friend right I mean he's a, he's a good mate of mine you probably know him um, and I met you know met him years ago he was just a scally like me and then he went somewhere and I went this this way and then we, we, we were drawn together in Bristol about 18 years like 18 years ago and he was he come over to me and he was like I was, I was just trying to get my shit together at the time and he'd already sort of got his he was he was there with it and he was trying to offer me a bit of like guidance and support and I was like what the fuck man? Are, you, are you fucking are you a Christian and I couldn't I was yeah. just confused I was just confused he was so a little bit better he was holding himself a little bit more he was he was thinking about what he was saying and I was like, wow, this is not the kids I met. You know, I used to have it with years ago. Mm. And now, now it's like, you know, we laugh at that and just think, you know, do you ever get that from... You're not supposed to be. Uh, I, as I say, you look change in other people's I've own. changed massively. I'm, yeah. I'll change. I'll be a different person fucking next year than who I am now. And that's my intention. Good. Because we're supposed to. We're all supposed to evolve and change and become, as I say, your deeply, deeply rooted purpose and everyone should be to evolve and to become the best he can be and for me it's not about like specific goals anymore I've had specific goals written goals I've done all that goal setting thing for seven, eight, eight years now me, me intentions just I want to fucking basically just live the best I can live be the best dad I can be be the best husband I can be be fucking learn and continue to study every day because I love sharing information I'm a coach I am a coach and, and I like to Basically, I go to Brazil and America and I come home, whatever I learn over there, I teach to my teammates. Even to the point where I might be a week out from a fight, I'm still teaching my teammates yeah. and sharing information with them. And I should be focused on my own journey, my own fight and my own opponent, but I wasn't. I, I actually loved coaching. And part of that was because when I did go over to Brazil and I was with all these lads, first few weeks, they wanted to kill me. They'd rip my head off. They'd fucking batter me. But I kept coming back and then they started like choking me and then, they show me exactly what they'd done now to escape it and how to and I remember feeling like no one had like you say before, no I weren't used to people doing things for me for nothing. I had the goodness of their heart. And then after a period of time, every time I walked in that gym, everyone had just basically just give me love and they give me love by fucking twisting me up and then saying, Well look, this is what you're doing wrong and this is how we caught you and the progress I made over the eight to ten weeks I was there. I came home a different person, yeah. not just physically, not technically, in every way. It just changed who I was, and for that reason, I continued to go there. Every time I came home, I felt like I'd leveled up, not just technically as a fighter, but as a person. I was becoming a better person. I was looking at my life yeah. and evaluating and everything. I was like, that's fucking so wrong. Do you that's, know what I mean? There's ways I was earning a living in my late teens where I was like, yeah. you can't earn a living causing damage or harm. To anyone's life, you're either gonna fucking get sick, I believe, or you're gonna go to yeah. fucking jail. Yeah, definitely. You know. Do you know what I mean? And that's the message of the time. Without speaking that way, that's the yeah. message of the time. Put into the kids in the schools. You can earn a living. You can have everything you want without harming anyone else. Do you know what I mean? And there'll be lads who watch this now. Go, he's fucking on a bend and whatever. I don't give a fuck. I'm not asked. That's it, mate. So what that's works it. for me has worked for me and people around me, and that's why I'm so open and happy you know to speak what? about it. Right, it's so similar. I can identify with the. Um, the journey of the Brazil in a similar way mm. with, with it's Thailand and going into a shell and not feeling like I fitted in and not wanting to fit in but do want, want question to, yeah, yourself questioning myself and you know they they once I started to uh, change they started to change their attitude towards me and exactly the same thing happened they started to show me things that I didn't know uh, because when I was in the ring with them, they would, they would seep in me, but they would seep me in this way and that way, and it was just that they just had me all over the show. You know what I mean? And then mm. they went, "This is what we do. This is how you. This is how you defend that. This is," and it was great. Um, and that was that was like, yeah, they were showing me love, 
in their way. And it, it was difficult for, for me to accept, and it still has been. It has been for years. Um, well, um, yeah, I'd like that to change. I felt love for the lads who were helping me. Genuine love for them. Because they were doing, as you say before, we were always within the society and culture where people don't do things for you for nothing. No. If someone does something for you, where we're from. That's because they want something back. There's always a motive behind or a reason why. But hand yeah. on heart, Evan, I do. I just do because... It's always come back to me. I've always tried to help people in any way I can. And it's always come back to me and that's just expressed in the life where I live. And it's not, I'm not talking about material things. I'm just talking about, I have bad days the same as everyone else. I'm not perfect. Sometimes I lose my temper. I'm a normal fella. But in general, I'm very, very happy. And I'm very self-aware. And when I'm not happy, there's certain things which I've learned through studying certain people. You know, fucking psychology, neurology, how your mind works, which if I know I'm not on the right path mentally, I've got methods and techniques which help me put me back on track where I need to be. And it helps me deal with situations that can come from, come from anywhere just in day-to-day life. Yeah, and that's the same with me. I, I can ring up someone and go, look, and they'll, it's like, you know, they'll point things out and say, look, well, maybe this is that and that's that. And mm-hmm. You can think about it this way. I think that's important for anyone. If you've got a, something going on, you know, you can, be, you, know you, you, can, you can always pick up that phone and reach out. Yeah. That's always been good for me, like. Mm. It's being open-minded as well. It's not like... If if you told me your view or opinion on something now, which is different to mine, then I'd like to think that if I thought it was, um, it might work for me, or I'm not closed-minded, do you know what I mean? You've got to be open-minded, especially to take help off other people. You've got to not be, like, basically believe that it's your way is the only way. Do, and do I would tell you, know, I've, I've, I've learned that because, you, you know, my way, you know, I won't let it cloud my judgment when it comes to what, what's good for your way. However, mm. right, I've had experiences where I know that I'm not in the wrong in some situations and, and I've been, you know, made, not made to feel because they can't make me feel that. But I felt as if they thought I was out of order. And I'm thinking, fucking hell, mate, it's, are you serious? It's not, and you're this and you're that. And I'm thinking, and then I'm questioning myself and I'm thinking if I'm wrong and I, you know, I'll own this I'll take ownership and go okay they, uh, maybe I am like you said before I've slapped you in the face but I will take it back to myself and go okay so what am I doing wrong here right what am I doing that's affecting this this individual why is he reacting the way he is towards me and then sometimes it's not about me it's about them yeah deflecting yeah, because they're like what's going on in their own and, life. Yeah, and when you see it, when you've learned that, and I don't even want to go there down this road. Yeah, but, being so there, you get someone, as we had a little conversation before the things, you get someone who starts hating on you and sending you a load of fucking nonsense on nice one, lad. social media. So for me, if the more time and energy I see someone put into that, because I've had it done about myself, yeah, and they've put time and energy into hating me, but I think where have they got to be mentally to, to actually want to sit there and spend time of their day trying to make me feel shit or trying to basically have a negative effect on my life or someone else's. Like, where where, where are they coming from? What have they experienced? What's happened to them? Have they been abused as a kid? Are they going through something really traumatic in their life? And that's, I'm not, and I'm not justifying or saying it's right what they're doing. But at the same time, I don't know why they're doing it. Do you know what I mean? So it's having that bit of empathy and kind of thing. Well, I don't really know what's going on in his life, but the same time, it's having the intelligence to go. And I'm I, not going to let it affect me in any way. I'm no, not going to no. let it take me attention because that's what, basically, that's what it wants. Whether it's you know, for whatever reason, that's what they want. I'll just stay focused on where I'm going, what I'm doing, my family, the people around me, who matter, and the stuff what I'm doing. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I I see it as like someone's really unwell, right? When they put that time and that effort and energy into something, it is an illness. It is an illness. It's um. It's quite sad that you, you can find yourself in a lonely place and the only friends you've got is that screen in front of you yeah. and the comments that are going up. It's in a way, the pe- people, people that you want to help them, don't you? Yeah, you want to help them. I you know, feel like you want to help someone, but the, the, the same people, you know, the can of fodder, the toxic kind of palm life that you've got, stroking your ego and selling you what an inspiration you're at. And you can believe all that. But in reality, when you turn that off and you're going to bed, then it's, what's going on? It's just your intention, isn't it? Intention's yeah. everything. What's your intention behind everything, what you do? With, with me, as using the social media as a good example, my intention. Yeah. And you know that because 
how consistent I am with it. And I have been for a long time. As I say, I use it as a tool to just fucking spread a bit of love in the morning. Try and help people in in some way. It doesn't take over my life. I don't fucking spend more than an hour a day on it. I try not to. If I spend an hour 20 on it today, I'll try and spend 40 <laughs> minutes on it tomorrow just to keep it so it's like you know, it's it's a you know i'm glad that you're here today because i'm learning a lot and i know this anyway because i'm aware of it and i'm aware of like but that's you know, one of the biggest problems because i hear everyone now especially because they know I, I like me meditation and i'm big on self-awareness is aware i'm aware of it now is the new excuse i'm aware of it i'm aware of it well I that know, doesn't make it all right no, that you're aware of it because yeah. what happens is sometimes it's actually even worse because if you become aware of it then that carries guilt because you're aware of it but you're not doing nothing about it so then you're starting to attach guilty emotions and things like that to it. Yeah. Which again, are even, wor- are even worse. It's better to be fucking oblivious to something what you're doing wrong, in a sense, than to actually be aware of it, but doing absolutely nothing about it. You say ignorance, yeah, like ignorance is bliss. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah. It's like, well, you could look at everything that's been going on over the last 18 months, as an example. Yeah. I'm aware of it. Do I put any time or attention on it? No. Does it save me life in any way? No. Does it distract me from wherever I am going with certain things in my life? Yeah. So I'm aware of it. I know what's going on. But I don't put no attention, no energy, and no, 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 stress. Ti- no time into no, it. Yeah, no stress at all. No. Cause, you know, stress because that's one of the biggest things that, you know, cause heart attacks. And, you know, Billy, the, the main reason why a lot of the stuff I do is because I've studied and I understand the impact of stress on your body. So people relate to cancers and all these diseases to food to, and, and think it's a physical thing. Yeah, sugar. But it's not the, the big, yeah, sugar causes fucking cancer and disease, yeah. All these things, they're proven to cause disease, but there's not enough awareness of is the um, results of stress. So, like, the, to explain it in, in the most simple way it can is, you're either in a state of growth or a state of survival. You can't be in both at the same time. A state of survival reverts back to when we were cavemen. Yeah. And for a small portion, sort of fucking half an hour, an hour of the day, we might go out and we're going to hunt for our dinner. But in that time, we're going out to hunt for our dinner. We're also being hunted ourselves by a saber-toothed tiger or whatever else it is. So you're in a high, heightened state of uh, awareness. Your adrenaline's going. Because um, you obviously you could get fucking net. Do you know what I mean? You've got to be ready to run, uh, fight. So it's like fight or flight, basically. You're in fight or flight. You're only supposed to be in that for sure periods of time. But what it does, it, it extracts all the energy from your immune system and from your brain takes all the energy from, and pushes it to your arms and your legs because if you need to run or you need to fight something off you're not asked over your, your immune system doesn't need to be operating at its best do you know what I mean and really you don't need to be super smart do you know what I mean you need to fight something you need to get off but when you're in in, in um, prolonged or lengthened states of survival which we're in now because stress has become a normal way of being yeah people like people live under stress and that's normal to them. If you took them out of stress, they'd want to subconsciously try and get back to being in that stressful state it's of survival because it's, it's always they know. It's, it's always they know, yeah. yeah. But really, scientifically, when you're in lengthened uh, periods of time under stress, which is our new normal, what you're doing is shutting your immune system down, suppressing your immune system and suppressing your, your brain, basically your, your prefrontal lobe, which is your thinking brain, your creative mind. So you, you're actually less intelligent and your immune system shutting down. Now, most of the diseases in the world are in mind in your body right now while we're sitting here. And they're called opportunistic organisms. And what that means is basically they're just waiting for an opportunity to, to kick in and to, to make us sick. Yeah. But your immune system's job is to suppress them, and that's what it does if you're healthy, if you're happy. But if you're in survival all day long, then your immune system's not working. All these diseases then can attack your body, and that's what creates the sickness. Uh, a bit of a... You know, I had a terrible time of that when uh, I was diagnosed with cancer and mm-hmm. I was stage three and I was non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Then I had hepatitis straight after it, so I was back to back with the, the interferon as well as the chemotherapy. So you can imagine, right, I went through six months of chemo, uh, cleared that, and was back to back with the interferon. I was, I was a fucking mess. But at the, si- at the same time, I was going through loads of gear, right, loads of stress, loads of relationship breakups. Loads of relationship makeups, loads of relationship shakeups. I was here, there, and everywhere. I couldn't be in one place, and my my behaviour was always off key. I was working full time. I was I was 
and I was I was in a, a, a heightened stage of stress. You know, I don't know whether that contributed to most of the illnesses. You think it does stress leads to stress causes cancer. Yeah, there was a lot of I had, I was getting a lot of information as well because it did look like it was like the CBD, the THC. It was on that. I was on um, you know the the the, the superfoods, the acidic stuff, avoid sugar, blend and everything. It was really um. There was a neuroscientist in America, right, and he got cancer. You know what he done? Locked himself in an apartment for a month with comedy films and cured himself. Seriously? Yeah, look it up. Mad, isn't it? So it's uh, laughter, any positive emotions, full of love. You, never, you, you wouldn't be full of love and, and, and joy, compassion if you fucking, if you were dying of cancer, would you? That sickness and, and love don't live in the same in the same body. So the, there's a guy called Joe Dispenser. He takes people who fucking haven't walked for years, chronic illnesses, people who've been blind. Sounds absolutely bonkers, right? But everything to speak about is science. Yeah. Science has led me to become so spiritual. there's evidence behind it. There's evidence yeah. behind every single thing I speak about. Evidence and experience. Because I've made myself sick. I used to fight. I pulled out to more fights than anyone with chest infections. Why? Because I was worried and concerned and focused over getting sick. All my attention was on, I'm going to get fucking sick a week before the fight. I know it. Cool, this is yeah. seven weeks out. Do you know what I mean? I know it. Week before, watch this. Watch me get sick a week before. Week before, fucking in for Zachary with a chest infection. So, going back to like, if you, I can use that as something where I can really, yeah, me and the lads, me and the team of lads every morning, for fucking 10 years, we had the same injuries. No, why? Every morning we walked in the gym and all we'd start a conversation. Richie, how's your elbow? Ah, oh, it's fucked, you know. How's your knee? It's fucked, it's killing me. It's not getting better. Why is it not getting better? Because we've been speaking about it every fucking morning, affirming that it's still there and I've done for the last 10 years. Where really we should be, you should be saying, Richie, how's your elbow? It's getting better, you know, sand. And it's that simple. People don't realise your words affect your, your, your physiology, your biology, the words you speak. Yeah, your body, think there. about it, yeah. right? Your body... Um, Everything's energy. Your body is just a community of cells. And that commands your community of cells. If that tells your community of cells to be sick, they're going to be sick. Yeah. They're not going to be well. It's interesting. It's, it, 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 and it is. this is all science. This is all like... Oh, you're like obviously going to get people doubting it and yeah, saying different great. things. But that's, that's but okay. All I'll ask is doubt it, but please, Joe Dispenza, go and look up Joe Dispenza. He takes people who haven't walked on, on week-long retreats, yeah. doing meditation, basically filling the heart full of love. That's what it's about. He fills them full of they feel that much fucking love through the meditation, the different exercise, but they do, they cure disease, they'll go there with a tumour, and a week later it's fucking either shrunk or it's gone. Wim off, the same. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I spent a week in Poland with Wim off. Did you spend a week with him, yeah? Yeah, one of the best experiences in my life, but prior to that, I spent a day with him in London. I'd studied him, I'd watch some of his videos. Yeah. I'd heard all these doctors saying, you can't do this, what he's doing is a load of shite, it's not proven in science. He went in a lab, where all doctors got hooked up to all whatever fucking they, they wanted to put them on. And, and what's he, that? And he proved them wrong. And then you've got scientists who've been working against them, standing on stage saying, we thought he was full of shit, and he proved us wrong. And we're actually here now on stage telling you, giving you a scientific explanation as to how the stuff what he practices and what he preaches, how it actually works and how it's real. Because I spent one day there and I left there and I thought, fucking hell, like, look at society, how many people make themselves fucking sick. Walk through town on a Saturday afternoon, see how many people are stressed, it's, struggling yeah, women yeah. with kids, families, and it's all, you know, it's normal. It's what you sell yourself, you become. Yeah. You know, and you become what you think about. There's, there's a quote, and it says, who are we but the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and actually believe. And all you're doing is living the story, what you tell yourself of who you are. And it's a load of bollocks, because you've just downloaded most of it from your mum, your dad. And the negative environment, what you grew up in. And when, even, when people when people actually give you positive affirmation, you struggle to accept it, you know, yeah. because you haven't heard it. But then, you know, for me, over the years, when someone says, when years ago they go, oh, "That's a nice top you got," and I go, oh, "This whole stuff, this whole thing," and then, now it's all good. Like, Thanks. You know what I mean? Yeah. But as before, uh, you know, you have to kind of explain or justify or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Instead of just going, yeah, that, there's your self esteem now, Bill. That's what someone says to me. There's your self esteem, and you just go, yeah. "Thanks, appreciate that, move on." Right, you don't need to kind of put it down and, and, and dismiss a comment. Because if you the, don't love yourself, how can you expect anyone else to love you if it doesn't fit in your worldview? No. And there's a lot of people out there, and it's sad that, that people, you know, I got told years ago, Bill, we'll love you till you can love yourself. That was a, a, a quote that was uh, put about a lot, right? And, and I didn't understand it, you know what I mean? We'll love you. People used to take care of me. 
you know, they'd, they'd sit with me when I was going through struggles, they'd, they'd spend time and they'd talk to me. Sometimes it, it, I'd drain the life out of them and they'd move me to, to someone else. They didn't just leave me on my own, someone else come in and start, like a mm. babysitting me, right? And I got through these these situations, the, the death of my father, the relationship breakups, the loss of the loss of kids. You know, I've had a, I've had a fucking few losses going on, but I've always had like, people or a network there supporting me. And it's always been positive. It hasn't, been, you know, like it's easy for someone to say, you know, when when you want something and you feel quite vulnerable and there's a moment of weakness that you'll speak to someone that en- enabled you to go and do that. You know, you've got a choice now. So I had a choice where I could just choose to pick up the phone and speak to someone who was going to say, look, that's not the right thing, let's sit down, let's do something different. Or I could go, and I've done it in silence, but I picked up the phone to someone who was using drugs, he was in the grip of it, I was, and he was off and running, and I went running with him. The next thing, I'm in jail. Instead of going, I had that choice, there was that, Bill, someone said, why don't you phone you? Such and such, you know, it's like, a, like, a, like a life coach, a mentor, sponsor. And I decided to phone someone else. And I, and I don't know what path I would have been, I don't know whether that would have helped. It might have, it might have, but, you know. I believe that where we are, it's right because now, every yeah. single thing what's happened to you, all of it, has led you to the point where you're at today. And I've had things happen to me in the past where I've kind of reframed them, which means I've changed my uh, perspective on them to become positive where like I use my dad as an example got addicted to drugs when I was two and my mum was pregnant with my little brother but if it weren't for him doing that my mum wouldn't be the woman who she is today and I wouldn't be the man who I am today so we I spent a long time resenting him and hate, hating him he left us for 18 years but I just changed it he left us alone purposely because he'd have done more damage than good if he'd have stayed around and I'm actually grateful and love him for it and it's like that's the greatest thing he could have ever given me yeah. Was, to, was to stay away do you know what I mean and that's because I am where I am because every single action every single thing what's happened in my life has put me where I am now and I can't put into words how grateful and blessed I feel I've bad days the same as everyone else but in general I actually fucking know there's someone or something looking out for me always has been and that's why I do everything what I do and it's yeah. that simple to say thank you yeah it is it's 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 nice, and you just like when you. I felt really kind mm. of. Um, I felt felt I felt it when you were talking about your dad because that's a big, big one for me, and it always has been, and I always re- had that resentment going yeah, on for hated years. Them. I did. I, I was I, gonna batter them. Yeah. Like, they used to, they used to be me thing. He turned up one Father's Day, and I was like, "You missed every Christmas. You missed every birthday. Fuck me, Ah Sean's birthday. My mum was in work. I was minding my little brother, and he just turned up on the door. It was only like." maybe 13, I was like, you better get away because if you come anywhere near me, I'll fucking kill you. You're an embarrassment and I was ashamed of him and to the point of changed my name. My name used to be my dad's name and I just felt dead angry, dead embarrassed and I actually went out my way and asked my mum to change my name um, to her name, which he still can't, like, I actually went and seen him six years ago and brought him back into the life, into our life, introduced him to his grandkids, moved him close to where I live so I could keep a bit of an eye on him, but he hasn't changed one bit, he's still the same drinking every night, he's still on methadone, really bad health. Like you'd think like going and introducing him to his grandkids and bringing him back into our lives after all that time, and giving him the motivation and inspiration to look after himself and take care of himself, but it's a disease. He's, he's too far gone yeah. on, I can I can only, I go and see him really three, four times a year, because I've spent time buying him food, going to see him every day, my mum's been doing his washing, my brother's back in his life, he's going walking his dog and... But there's no thank, thanks for it. It's just like, oh. you fucking change your name and you've done this and yeah. you mask this and there's, this there's happened. A, there's, a, there's a lot of selective thinking. And I had that with my dad. I sat there with him, right? We didn't even talk. It was just awkward. I just wanted to be in his in the presence. I always wanted to just say, you know, I cared about you, loved you, and acknowledged me. Uh, and that affected me in a, a massive, massive contributing factor to the way I turned out, I believe, because he wasn't a role model. You know, it was a role model that was bad beating me mad up, or, you, know, you know, he's dead now, but I think the last four years of his life, just sitting with him, and he, I never knew nothing about him, he never told me who he was, nothing about his family, growing up, so, you know, I, I didn't understand at that time, it was like, there was a moment where I seen him, and I looked in his eyes, it was the first time we our eyes locked him, and I, I seen the pain, and the misery, and the heartache, everything, I don't know what, just bang, everything in his eye that, and he turned away and I did and um, he caused me to oh, it was like Whoa. you know and I hated him but at that moment it changed and I thought you know who am I to judge mm-hmm. you know 
you know, so and I showed him love and compassion and and, and that. And he said to me, you know, one, you know, he said to me on on, on his deathbed, and that was the, the first time that I'd ever really believed him. That he said I love you, and I was like, fuck, you know, and I, I was old on his hand, you know. So he wasn't alone when he passed and he moved on. And there was something strange that happened. There was about thirty people in the room in the hospital in Weston. And as soon as he, I remember it was 28 minutes past 10 in the morning and he, and, he, and he passed. And the whole room just went cold. Just something had gone. Everyone felt it, not just me. It was like other people. So it was, that was the first time I thought, the energy's moved. It's, it's gone somewhere else. But yeah. And for me, at that time, I don't even know where it is. I think I'm probably identified. My, my brothers and sisters, I'm the oldest, there are six of us. They all started breaking down and sobbing and that. Because I'd processed that each day. I, I was got and I was aware of what I was feeling and I was, the expectations. I kind of stood up and went, you know what? It's okay, just let them go now. And we just I was there for them. It wasn't about me. How I felt and oh I thought you know, it's not about how I feel, it's about me mum, you know, it's about me brothers, me sisters, you know, what can I do for them and how can I be there for them? And that was a, like a moment which really changed my 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 way of thinking, you know, it's yeah. There's a guy who I'm really into called Jordan Peterson. He he basically says, I've heard of him. Jordan Peterson's mega, and um, just his outlook and the way he speaks about a lot of things. Uh, there's two quotes I'll tell you the other one in a minute, but one of the the main ones that he says is he says, "You want to be that fucking guy at the funeral where everyone like he supports everyone, and that that's who as a man, that's who you want to aspire to be. Be that person, not the person." Not saying there's anything wrong with be obviously struggling or weeping or, but I, I, as a man, you want to be the, pit, the, the the fucking backbone of the family. That's something to be proud yeah. of. Do you know what I mean? And it is. No, I think, it, it I, is. I, I think I learned that pretty good because I spoke to a friend and some, you know, me she was going, "Why aren't you upset and all that?" Was and I told me, I told a, a friend of mine, a close friend of mine. I said, "You know," he said, "Bill, look, there's two brothers now. I'm going to tell you this story. There's two brothers, and they're at the graveside." The Betty and the mum, and one of the brothers is in tears, he's in bits, he's shopping, you know, and he's going for it. And the other brother's just standing there, you know, just standing there. And there's a couple of lads who were looking over and going, Where's he crying there? And he's not. And his mate said, You know what's happening? He's feeling the feelings now, right? And he'll probably feel them later. That's what happens. People feel feelings differently. They catch up with you a few oh, days sure. later. So for me, you know, it's obviously I go through the grieving process and I feel it. But I, I, I knew what was coming and I prepared myself. And, you know, he had cancer. It was fucking, it was riddled in it. You know, and then 12 months later, this is quite ironic, right? 12 months later, I got asked by the director of this movie to play my dad in the movie, right? Uh, he said he's going to come and visit you in this prison in Thailand. He said he never he never came to see me. He said, yeah, but he will in this one. Okay. So I'm on set, just being diagnosed a week before with cancer, playing my dad, right? Watching this kid through bulletproof glass come. It was me. It was just a young... It was the, the actor was playing me, and he had this character study, and it was just like... And the director said to me, what would you say to your son now? That was you, you know. I was like, couldn't say nothing. I couldn't string a sentence together. I was fucking all over the gap with it. And all I ever wanted to say was like, "I love you." You know, that's what I wanted to, to hear. I know it. It's it was a big thing for me, you know, for him to actually say it and mean it. Yeah. Uh, and that's all I ever wanted to hear. But so you can imagine the feelings I was I was experiencing. That. I'm playing my own dad who just died twelve months before the cancer, and I've got I'm diagnosed with cancer, playing him. It was just like, what? Like that, you know, like how cruel can I have to do? It was like it was, and I had to put a. I, 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 you'll see it in the film. I had a scarf, right, around my, um, around my neck because it was that embarrassed and ashamed of this this grotesque kind of tumor that it was protruding from my neck. You know, because the vanity, yeah, you know, my vein, how people perceive me. They see it because it looked horrible. It looked like it was. It was. It was gross and. Um, in a, it was I, I thought this is never going to go away I'm going to fucking die of it all them t- you know when you talk about all them all them horrible f- thoughts and them um, and then someone said to me Bill you know when people say to you when you've got like an illness like that you know you hear that cliche don't you you need to fight it and I'm thinking well, how, do, how do you fight something that's invisible that you can't see 
And you want to say to put on a pair, I put on a pair of gloves, and I set up a punch bag in me in my kitchen, and I just started smashing that, and I thought this is that's what I saw it as. That was the illness, and things started to change. You want know, to start to fight back, yeah, man? Wow. Started to fight back. Things started to change, and then the eighth of February two thousand and seventeen, bang, uh, built like to say that you've cleared this like fucking hell you know it was it was a, a, you know you call it a miracle or what but I don't know it's just and the people say how do you get through it and, do you think it was the CBD I, I think no I think it was just a positive mental a, attitude mind. because I just okay I got that acceptance but around it you know Mark I did CBD and all these things help but ultimately you've got to beat it there before you beat yeah. it anywhere else because you get Billy honest to God you get people who like yeah less than 1% there's different st- statistics. Some say beats less than one. Some say less than three percent of all the knee disease is yeah. gen- is is down to defective genes. But if one or two people get cancer, well, why is that? It's environmental. Is it food? Well, partly yeah, but most of it's because stress is our the culture and the society we're born into now is full of stress in terms yeah. of fucking buying your kids the latest fucking trainees. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because you're scared of what? Everyone will think you're fucking you're a meth if you haven't got a pair of one tens. That's what's creating like this the whole system. The image. The whole system's fucked. Do you know what I mean? This is not a negative conversation. This is reality. The whole system's fucked. And, and it's fucked because we're in a, this world where we're all competing with one another. Do you know what I mean? And it's bollocks. It's really all you want to do is all everyone just give each other a big hug and help each other and me give you what you need and you give me what I need and we exchange skills to, Life to is feed each other. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and it, it's like we're, we're born into the fucking society in a world where it's like, as, as you say before, why people don't do things for people unless they get something back. But yeah. it, it shouldn't be like that. We should just be able to all help, help each other. Yeah, yeah. But the world we live in, it's not that way. And there's fucking, again, I'm the least, I pay no attention to conspiracies, any of these theories or whatever, even though half of them have fucking sort of come through. I don't pay no attention because they don't take me or affect. They yeah. don't basically make me feel. They make me feel shit. Yeah, I tell to get involved. So I it? don't get involved, and my focus f- fully on anything which makes my life and the people around me's lives better in any way. And that's that's where my attention's always on. Always on that from the, the times I get up in the morning, massive on routine and rituals. As I say, I'm up a quarter five every morning. Make sure I fucking meditate. I exercise. I do cold water exposure. I spend a solid two hours every morning working on on myself to just basically lay the foundations for the rest of the day and for me to become the best person I can possibly be. And I do that consistently all year round. I have my dips, I have my bad weeks, my good weeks, but I always fall back on my routine and my rituals because they're what pull me through. Brilliant. Do you know what I mean? So I can be having my bad couple of days, but at the same time I practice and I've learned mechanisms, yeah, 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 which put out. me mentally back where I need to be. I know that. I've had enough bad days in the past, the same as everyone to know that deal pass and what's a bad day today is just a fucking memory next week. Yeah. <laughs> but if I keep dwelling right. on it, yeah. then obviously I'm going to keep replaying it. You've you just got to be constantly looking forward. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I love your attitude towards life. Um, you know, I'm coming to the end uh, of this podcast and, you know, I'm sure we'll do another one going forward when I get more bad days. Um, but I always say this, Mark, at the end of every podcast, is there any pearls of wisdom? Is there anything you say to a, York, a young Mark Scanlon walking through the doors of life now? I know you've said a lot, but... Just the, the quote quotes. I said to you before, yeah. the quote is, fucking, who are we but the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves? I don't give a fuck, right, if you come from not a screen, fucking dovecot, toxic, tubruch. If, you, if you're a kid, mate, and you come from the worst of the worst, just because your mum and dad fucking have grown up in a negative environment mm. and the people who are around you... You can rewrite your own story. You don't have to live this fucking story because the story what most of the people are living in now automatically without even knowing, it's a fucking big load of bollocks. And you can, we're capable of fucking any... We're capable of so much more than what we're led to believe in our in, in society and all these things. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that, that that's the message. You don't have to fall into the same patterns as what your parents have. Let it stop with you. Yeah. Because it's, you know... it's Break that cycle. Yeah, because... The stuff I do, like even the centre where I've got awake, it's a self-development centre. If I can change someone's perspective and make them healthier, make them happier, give them some information which makes them live a better life, that doesn't just change their life because they'll have kids who are following the same patterns as them and their kids will have changed generations yeah. forever for as long as they go. Because all we're doing now is reliving really fucking generate past generations right. and you got to think there's been world wars and all kinds of fucking poverty, depressions. We're living the effects of that now. Yeah. So you've got to stop it now and then going forward, 
you know that's how you that's how you, you want to create a better world focus on the kids yeah and that, that's my p- purpose in the schools and the same as what you're doing yeah i enjoy it it's kind of mm-hmm. like that intervening at that age you know we were we were being so lucky but i wasn't anyway no one was coming to my school apart from the police you know what I mean? yeah <laughs> looking to arrest me um do you know what mark i'll put all your yeah, your, your social, all your socials in, in the description and where you can find it. It's, you, is it Awake? Awake Liverpool is the awake. centre, but I've got on my own one, just Mark Scano. I'll put that down then, Mark. And, uh, you know what, mate? I really appreciate the chat. Hey, mate. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, Thanks, Billy.